بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله أما بعد إن شاء الله عز وجل for the next three Fridays we're going to deal with uh, some of the benefits that we get from Surah Yusuf that are taken from the Surah we're not going to give the tafsir of the Surah but we're going to take the Surah and give some of the benefits of the Surah the great scholar of Islam, Al-Imam Ibn Al-Qayyim, the student of Ibn Taymiyyah, Rahmatullahi Alayhima, he said in a book that he wrote, which was called Kitab Al-Da'i wa dawa the book of the disease and the medicine. Tremendous book, Tazkiyah to Nafs. He mentioned in that book that in Surah to Yusuf, there are over 1,000 Benefits. He said he looked at the surah, he pondered the surah, and in this chapter he saw that there were lessons, and there were examples, and there were wisdoms, and there were a lot of ahkam that the Muslims should come to know about. He said, if Allah gives me life, I'm going to write a book in which I'll mention these 1,000 or so benefits. But Allah Azawajal caused him to die and he never wrote that particular book. So that's a scholar from Al-Islam who, from his wide and expansive itila, knowledge, books, his ability to look at things and to see the deeper meaning of things. He had a niyat, he had a goal, he had an objective to write a book in addition to all of those other books that he wrote. And they are a lot where he wanted to gather all of the benefits of Surah to Yusuf. And that, or over a thousand benefits in Surah to Yusuf. And that goes to show the alu al himma that he had, the high determination that he had, rahmatullahi alayhi. And we spoke about his high determination in different issues. The way he wrote the book as a gift to his relative when he didn't have the money to buy a gift after his relative had a child. So he wrote a book between Salat al-Asr, Salat al-Dhuhr, and Salat al-Asr about the ahkam of how to welcome the child, the do's and the don'ts. And that book has become one of the cornerstones of the ahkam of the aqiqah. And why did he write it? Because he didn't have the money to purchase a gift for his relatives. So he just sat and he wrote a book between Dhuhr and Asr, and he gave the book to him as a gift. He had ulu al himma. So, with that being in the case, inshallah, Azza wa Jal, we'll just pick out some of these benefits and we won't deal with giving the tafsir of every ayat, every verb, every word, and so forth and so on. Tremendous scholar, Al Imam Al Fayruz Abadi, Rahmatullahi Alayhi, he said about Surah Yusuf along with a number of ulama of Islam. That the Qisas of the Quran Furriqat Fi Amakin Kathira. Allah, when He told the stories about different personalities in the Quran, every single individual that He spoke about in the Quran was mentioned in multiple places, with the exception of Surah Yusuf. All of Yusuf's story is located in just this particular surah, and He's not dealt with in other surahs in detail. Ibrahim, he has a surah with his name. Maryam, she has a surah with her name. Hud, he has a surah with, her, with his name. But although they have surahs with their names, they're still mentioned and their story is mentioned in other parts of the Quran. Whereas Surah Yusuf only, it's the only surah with the name of the Rasul, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi, and everything about his story was mentioned in this one place. So there are a lot of things that the Muslim needs to know about Yusuf and the Surah Yusuf, many things. As it relates to Yusuf himself, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in order to raise his shan, his situation, he said, Rahimallahu Ahi Yusuf, Falaw du'itu ila ma du'iya ilayhi lastajabtu. May Allah have mercy upon my brother Yusuf. 
For verily, if I was invited to do what Yusuf was invited to do, verily, I would have answered the invitation. So he was praising Yusuf, showing the people. Yusuf was invited to do something that he refused to do. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, if I was invited to that same thing, I would have done it. Now what comes to the mind of a lot of people is the invitation of the woman. But when we know in our aqidah, it's not permissible for a prophet to do something crazy like that. We have to exclude that. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if he was invited by the woman of the Aziz or any other woman to do something like that, he would have refused. He would have been the first to refuse, even before Yusuf. So what was it that Yusuf was invited to? After he gave the interpretation of the dream of the king, the king sent the people and said, tell him to come out, tell him to come out of the prison. And Yusuf refused to come out. He said, go back and find out what is the condition of those women who lied on me. I'm in this prison because these ladies lied on me. That's why I'm in a prison. Go back and find out if they're going to tell the truth or not. So when they went back to talk to those women to find out what happened, Allah Ta'ala mentioned, فَالَّبِثَ bid'a sinin. He remained in the prison for three to nine extra years. Not one year, not two years. He remained in the prison for a number of years and he was innocent. That's what the Prophet was saying, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If I was invited to come out of the prison, I'd have came out of the prison the very first day. I'm in the prison because of the shahada to zur, false witness. These women are lying. I didn't try to seduce this woman at all. She's lying. She tried to seduce me. And you put, put, put me in the prison? So now the opportunity comes for the faraj, where the faraj, you can get out. Rasul said, I would have come out, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But Yusuf didn't come out. So he was raising him. And he said that Yusuf was Karim, Ibn Karim, Ibn Karim, Ibn Karim. He is the son of, he himself is Karim, and he's the son of one who was Karim. And he was the son of one who was Karim, and he was the son of one who was Karim. And we're going to come to that issue. So there are a lot of benefits in studying the Quran in general, but specifically Surat Yusuf, as you're going to see, inshallah ta'ala. The Prophet, he mentioned in the authentic hadith, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam, al-jannatu aqrabu ila ahdikum min shiraq na'lihi wa narun thru thalika. The paradise is closer to one of you, it's closer to you, then you are very shoestring. Paradise is closer to you than your shoestring. He said the hellfire is the same way. That easy a person can go into the Jannah, he can go into the Naq. He can go into the Jannah if he do the right things, like do the tafsir of the Quran, busy himself with reading the Quran, as opposed to busying himself with he says, she said, ghiba, namim, and all of that, kalamun fari. And also the hellfire is the same way. Person can do something, and if he do die to die on that thing, the hellfire is real close to him. So, learning the Quran is from those issues. So, we don't want to go into the virtues of coming to the learn the Quran, coming to the masjid, but there are a lot of virtues, a lot of virtues. Just want to get into the issue of the surah. Allah Ta'ala mentioned in the beginning of the surah, after A'udhu Billahi min Shaitan al Rajim, Bismillah ar Rahman al Rahim, Alif Lam Meen, or Alif Lam Ra. He mentioned those haruf and muqatta'a, those haruf that a number of the chapters of the Quran begin with. Tilka ayatul kitab al mubin. This, these are the ayat of the book that is clear. We don't want to get into, as I mentioned, the tafsir of the Quran, but from the benefit of these surahs that begin like that is that. They go to show the miraculous nature of the Quran and that Allah challenged the non-Muslims of Quraysh during that time to come and to produce and to present ten ayat like the Quran or even one ayat like the Quran. And some of their fusaha, their bulaga, people who really knew the language, they actually tried to duplicate the Quran. But when they did that, 
they became the laughing stock of the community because they were not able to be successful in duplicating the beautiful mel melody of the Quran along with the meanings, the deep meanings of the Quran. So, first thing we want to mention is the Book of Allah in these ayat, Alif Lam Mim, Alif Lam Ra, Sad, Qaf, all of those ayat that Allah Ta'ala mentioned, those surahs, they start like that. It is from the ijaz of the Quran, the miraculous nature of the Quran. We have a book with us, a book that we have that is a miracle. So as we sit there, we know the Prophet had many miracles, sallallahu alayhi wa many tremendous miracles. Al-Isra wal miraj some people apostated when they heard about that story. The splitting of the moon, being able to interpret the speech of the animals, many miracles. But whatever miracle that you know that he had or he did, there's no miracle that's greater than the Quran. So when a person is mesmerized and he says, wow, that was a deep, heavy, high-powered miracle, his response as it relates to the Quran and its miraculous way should be the same thing or even more. And in the Quran ayat from the book, that makes things clear. Unlike the previous books that have been revealed, the ayat of the Quran are easy to understand. They're easy to understand and they're easy to memorize for the one who puts the time in. As for the one who doesn't make an effort and he doesn't put the time in, they more than likely won't learn. I know people sitting in this audience right now, they've been learning the Quran studying the Quran and they work and their work schedule it fluctuates so they have to miss classes here and there but once a person engages himself and he applies himself and puts himself in the class of the Quran he's going to see wow after being in this class for so many months I have definitely moved forward and one of the things that shaitan doesn't want from us especially you young people but all of us he doesn't want anyone here to taste the sweetness of learning that Quran and the way you feel good about yourself as you learn the Quran. I know people. I know people. A person, they look at themselves as not being educated. They look at themselves and they say, I can't do this. I can't do that. I'm like this. I'm like that. I saw them studying the Quran, studying the ahkam of a tajweed. And they know more of the ahkam of a tajweed than just a regular person. They know more of those ahkam than the vast majority of people who are sitting here. If you tell them or you ask them about the ahkam of the med of the Quran, this person could tell you all kinds of information. But within themselves, within themselves, they think and they feel about themselves that they don't measure up. I'm not the smartest person. I can't do it. But when they were learning the Quran, and I used to see and I used to meet them and talk to them. I was amazed at the miraculous nature of the Quran. Not just that it's a miracle from Allah, but within the individual. It will give you knowledge. It will make you in a position where you can overcome those insecurities. I can't, I can't, I can't. And also, it will raise you above the station and the level of people or your contemporaries. Those people who are not learning the Quran. So this first ayat of the Quran, Ikhwani, the book of Allah Azawajal is a miracle from Allah. It has the right, it deserves that we engage in it, we connect to it. Today was Friday. So how many people read Salat, uh, the chapter of Al-Kahf in the blessed month, in the sacred month of Rajab, the Friday, he read Surah Al-Kahf. That's going to benefit him. But we're going to go on, inshallah, because we have a lot of issues that we need to deal with, inshallah Azawajal. And the next ayat is a tremendous benefit from Allah Azza wa Jalla where he mentioned, "Inna anzalnahu Arabian, Quran in Arabian, laallakum taqilun." We have revealed this Quran and we made it an Arabic Quran, in the hopes that you people would understand. So Allah Taala established in this ayat and other ayats that the Quran has been revealed in Arabic, and the reason for that is for people to understand. This ayat goes to show. A number of things. It goes to show that the Arabs are the Madatul Islam. The Arabs. 
They are the origin of Al-Islam. And I mentioned this many times before, that the world may need the West and the technology of the West. That may be a, you know, a fact. The Muslim world, we need the West. No problem. Nothing wrong with that. But in terms of knowledge of this religion, this ummah is in need of the Arab. The Arab scholars, the Arab people. Allah sent down the best book. The Quran is the best book. And he sent the best book down in the best language, the language of the Arabs. And he sent this Quran down on the best human being, who was Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And was brought to Muhammad by the best angel, Jibril sallallahu alayhi And was brought to him in the best city when it started, in Mecca. And it was brought down and sent down in the best month, the month of Ramadan. Laylatul Qadr Khairim al Fishar. So, Arabic language. This ayah shows from the benefits that the Arabic language is the most afsah, awsa, abyan language on the face of the earth. It's the most eloquent language. It is the widest one. I received a WhatsApp message where someone drew the face of a man without his eyes. And they put hair on different parts of the face. The hair on the eyebrows, these eyelids, the hair right here, the lihya, the hair here, the, the hair where a person is having receding hairline, all of that. It was about 20 different types of hair, places of the hair. The Arabs have a name for each one of those hairs. Each one. In the Arabic language, I'm married to a girl, and another man is married to a sister. So he's my brother-in-law. But which brother-in-law is he? Am I married to his sister? Is he married to my sister? The Arabic language is so precise that these types of issues that have been mentioned in the Quran, there is precision, diqqa. So Allah revealed the Quran in the Arabic language. Why? Because the Arabic language will give the people the ability to understand what Allah wants them to understand. And therefore the Quran cannot be translated correctly. So when we say Allah said this and Allah said that, what we should always really say is the meaning of which is this or that. Because the Quran can be translated by in any other language, whatever the case is. So what is the point here? The point here is, we all should re recognize and respect the Arabs. Doesn't mean that Abu Lahab, Abu Jahl, no, I'm not talking about that. But don't be of the people who have this hatred towards the Arabs for whatever reason. The Arabs have a special place in this religion. And the companion Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan used to tell the Arabs, hey you Arabs, you better take care of this Quran before Allah Ta'ala you better take care of what Allah revealed to you before Allah Ta'ala changes you with a group of people going to take care of what Allah has revealed to them. So the point here is, the Arabs have a special position. And we have a number of hadith where the Prophet mentioned the Arabs, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he meant the ummah. Like he told the people, وَيْلٌ Arab, min الشَّرَ الَّذِي اقْتَرَبْ Woe unto the Arabs from the evil that has come close, meaning yawm al-qiyamah. And he mentioned the Arabs, but he meant this ummah. When he talked about the fitting of some of the things that's going to happen before Yom Al-Qiyamah, the people said, describe those people to us, Ya Rasulullah, that we need to be aware of. He said, they are people who are from us. Hum min jildatina. They have the same skin. They are the same as us. Yatakallamuna bi al sinatina. They talk with our language. Point here is that he used the Arabs as the example of this ummah. So it becomes a khwani wajib, as Al Imam al Shafi said in his book, Al Umm, it is wajib, yajibu al al Muslim, and yet ta'allam. The Muslim has to learn the Arabic language to the best of his ability. Something that you have to do. This is their language. But their language is the language that Allah 
revealed his last book in, and he revealed his last book to the last prophet who spoke that language. Now, that doesn't mean that the Prophet was sent only to the Arabs. I'm the messenger of Allah to all of you people. And this is one of the miracles of the Quran and one of the miracles of Islam. That although the Arabs, this is their religion, it started with them. I don't want to say it's their religion. It started with them, but they're not the majority of Muslims. Non-Arabs outnumber the Arabs. And from those non-Arabs who have become Muslims are those great large numbers and multitude of Muslims who know Arabic language, who have memorized the Quran. Some of them know the Arabic language better than the Arabs themselves. So again, I call your attention to the last khutbah that I gave here about being people who are inferior. Why are we going to be inferior? Well, la Islam is the haq. You other people don't know your language. You don't know the language of your book and you don't know the language of your NBA. None of you know the language of your book or your NBA. Any religion you come, you bring it here. You either don't know your Nabi and your Rasul. You don't know who he is. You just have a religion. You have a religion. Sikhism, Hinduism. As for Judaism, Christianity, my mother, she doesn't know a word that Isa ibn Maryam was speaking. She doesn't know a word. Not one single word. Whereas everybody in this audience, not only do you not, not only do you know more than one word, you may not be able to string a sentence together, but there are many words that the Prophet mentions وسلم, that we know. Almost every Muslim knows what that means. Every Muslim. Every Muslim knows what that sentence means. And many ayat of the Quran. So it becomes a bit easy for us to be kind of tough on ourselves. And I think we need to be tough on ourselves sometimes to do better. But if the truth were to be told, the Muslim ummah, with all of our weaknesses and our farness from the deen, nonetheless, if you were to contemplate and to consider the reality of this ummah, al-Islam is the haq. Too many non-Muslims. I'm looking in the audience right now, and the majority of the people who are here are not even Arabs. They're not even Arabs. So who in his right mind is going to say this religion is the religion of the Arabs because this Quran was revealed to them? No, we're going to say to the Arabs, what Muawiyah bin Abi Sufyan said, may Allah be pleased with them. Hey, you Arabs, you better come and take care of what Allah has revealed to you before Allah brings a group of people who are going to take care of it in your place. And that actually happened. So you look at those ulama of al-hadith and those ulama of tafsir Many of those ulama were not even Arabs. They were from the Ajam. But I want to get this point across to you brothers. The Arabs are the Maddatul Islam. I remember one time I wrote an article or something like that. that some of the ulama of the past, like Imam Ahmed and other than them, he has said that from the usul of the sunnah, it's for every Muslim to believe in Munkar and Nakir. From the usul of the sunnah is to believe in the Mizan, Yom al Qiyamah. From the usul of the sunnah is for an individual to believe that the Quran is the kalam of Allah and all of those issues. He mentioned as well, from the usul of the sunnah is for the Muslim to believe in the special position of the Arabs. Doesn't mean an Arab is better than us just because he's an Arab and he's doing all kind of craziness. But Allah Ta'ala has chosen those people, chose their language, chose their place, and chose his Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to be from amongst them. From the benefits of the Quran, Ikhwani, very important Surah Yusuf is the third ayat where Allah Ta'ala mentioned, نَحْنُ نَقُصُّ عَلَيْكَ أَحْسَنَ الْقَصَصْ بِمَا أُوْحَيْنَا إِلَيْكَ هَذَا الْقُرْآنِ We have revealed to you, Ya Muhammad, the best of speech, the best story in that we reveal Surah Yusuf to you. It is the best story. So the person is not in need of any other story. He doesn't need to sit his children down to watch the cartoons. Let him sit down and explain the benefits of Surah to Yusuf to his kids. And there are a lot of benefits, as you're going to see, that children can relate to and appreciate. Us, ourselves, all of us, grown-ups. The Quran, Surah to Yusuf, is the best story Allah Azza mentioned. 
So whatever, whatever movie I want to watch, whatever movie a person wants to look at, Surah to Yusuf is much better than that. Much better than that. The scholars had ikhtilaf. Why did Allah say that Surah to Yusuf is the best story? Some of them said because if you look at the mujawara of, Surat, of Yusuf to his brothers, look how Yusuf dealt with his brothers. Look at the sabr that he had with his brothers. Look at the hilm that he had with his brothers. He was halim. Many of us who are sitting in the audience, we have drama. People are doing bad to us. And we're the type of people who, hey, hey, you're not going to step on my toes. If I can help it, you step on my feet. You step on my toes, I'm going to push you off of my toe. Because I don't want anybody backing me up against the wall. Some of us are like that. Some of us are having problems at work, at school, at home, where we're getting drama. Whose drama is similar to Yusuf and what his brothers did with him and did to him. And yet, throughout all of that, throughout all of that, the way he dealt with them. That's one of the reasons this is the best story. Again, I know people who have been oppressed. People said things about them that weren't even true. People were talking about them. They didn't even know what they were talking about. But they made a lot of kalam. And that individual has a lot of hatred as a result of that. And that's understandable. But if you compare what they said and what they did to you, to what the brothers of Yusuf did to him. This is one of the best stories right here. Some of the scholars said also, when you look at the Quran, all of the Quran has good stories, but Yusuf is the best story. But you look at the stories of the Quran, the Quran talked about the stories of the NBA in detail, talked about the stories of the Salihin in detail, talked about the stories of the ulama, certain ulama in the Quran, the stories of the juhal, ignorant people in the Quran. Stories of the men, story of the women, story of the malaika in the Quran, story of the tujar, people or businessmen in the Quran, the story of the kings in the Quran, the story of the slaves in the Quran. This Quran didn't leave anything out. Story of the birds, story of the an'am, the cattle, whatever you're looking for under that sun, this Quran has mentioned it in some shape, form, or fashion. And it's a book that is full of a lot of benefits. Surah to Yusuf itself, bid that, Surah to Yusuf, is a surah that if the person were to sit down to learn it and to extract from it, it's ahkam. It is, as Allah mentioned, the best story. And he ended the surah with a similar ayat. That's Surah to Yusuf. And you have in his story, in this story, a tremendous ibra, a tremendous lesson and a tremendous example. So in the fact that Allah Ta'ala told us about the story of Yusuf, it goes to show also the importance of studying history, Islamic history, that Allah is encouraging us with Surah to Yusuf and these other surahs to be people who study history. Read to them, Ya Muhammad, the story of the two sons of Adam in truth. So all of these people went before us these are historical issues that are being mentioned for the sole purpose, one of the purpose of Allah mentioning those stories and the details of their lives so that people can know what happened with the people who went before us so that we can get examples and that we also can take from that things that are going to strengthen us. So studying and learning about history, Islamic history is imperative. At the end of that ayat, Ikhwani, is an important issue. When Allah Ta'ala said, this is the best story when we reveal to you this Qur'an, Allah Ta'ala said to the Prophet Sallallahu Although you, Ya Muhammad, before this surah was revealed, you were from the ghafileen. The ghafileen, the people who didn't know. Ghafla, ghafla. Ghafla is like a person who is sitting here and someone is doing something that you don't know about and you shouldn't know about it. That's ghafla. Ghafla. Not knowing what your children are up to. That's ghafla. Allah Ta'ala said that the Prophet was, وسلم, was from the ghafileen. So this ayah goes to show if a prophet or a messenger 
has been described as having ghafla and being unaware and unknown, it's not necessarily negative. It's not an aib. And that's because there are two types of ghafla. One type of ghafla, which is praise, which is not praiseworthy, and the other one is where a person has no blame. The one that's praise is, is blameworthy is when a person is supposed to know. Hey, you saw this movie before, you saw this script, you read it before, you should know. So now if you are not aware and it happens, now you're blameworthy because you should know. You know you should be looking at the kid. You should be on top of him because of what happened before. The one who is a God feel like that, he's blameworthy. And that's not what the Prophet was, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The meaning of this ayat, the Prophet was from the ghafileen, meaning, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, did not have any previous knowledge about the Quran and these stories. The ulama from his companions, they didn't have any previous knowledge about this, these stories of the Quran. So some of the enemies of Islam, they come and they say, look, Ghafla is a negative word in Arabic, and it is. If someone said to you, you're ghafil, that's a bad description. If you don't know the Arabic language. And most people, if you say to them, you have ghafla. Some people, if he knows the Arabic language, he says, of course I have ghafla. I don't know everything. There are things I don't know and I never knew. But if a person was supposed to have known something, he knew it, he was taught it, he was warned about it, and then he turned a blind eye to it and it happened, this is the ghafla that is not praiseworthy, that, that is blameworthy. So our Nabi and our Rasul Sallallahu was, was in this ayat described as having ghafla, meaning he didn't know. And that's a refutation against that hazir nazir nonsense. And it's also one of the many refutations against people who say that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he had the ilm of the unseen. We come to the next ayat, Akhwari, and now we begin to get into some of the more so-called nitty-gritty of the issue. Allah Ta'ala, he mentioned, إِذْ قَالَ يُوسُفُ لِأَبِيهِ يَا أَبَتِي إِنِّي رَأَيْتُ أَحْدَ عَشْرَ كَوْكَبًا وَالشَّمْسَ وَالْقَمَرُ رَأَيْتُهُمْ لِي سَاجِدِينَ And remember when Yusuf said to his father, Ya Abati, O oh my father, O oh my respected father, O oh my dear father, Verily I saw 11 stars and I saw the sun and the moon. I saw all of them making prostration to me. This ayat of the Quran in Surah Yusuf is an important one for a number of reasons. The ulama of al-Islam, they took from this the way Yusuf obviously addressed his father is in a way of respect. And if we were reading the Quran as a family and individuals, we would look throughout the Quran that many of the prophets and the messengers and the righteous people in the Quran used to address family members with respect, like Ibrahim, Ya Abati, Lima Ta'budu ma la yasma'u la yubsir. Oh, my father, my dear respected father, why do you worship that which doesn't hear and it can't see? Luqman used to say to his son, Ya Bunayya, Oh, my beloved son, my young, small, beloved son. He would speak to him words of affection. Yaqub said to his children, Ya Baniya, Oh, my sons, Oh, my sons, none of you should die except as Muslims. Isa ibn Maryam, he said that Allah has made him the day he was born and the day he dies, someone who's respectful to his mother. So the point here is, the righteous people of the Quran, the father to the son, the son to the father, we find in the Quran, family members addressing each other with respect. Oh, my little brother, hey, my big sister. And some of our languages, they have words to distinguish between the big sister or the big brother, the senior brother, the senior sister. And now with the uh, generation that we're living with right now, things are quickly changing. I want to bring this to your attention, Khwani, that we have to teach our children adab to say thank you. I remember 
When I was young, my father, when I was young, he used to call older people who he didn't know, yes, ma'am, and yes, sir. I used to think because he would do that when we used to go to the south where my grandmother, grandfather were, where African Americans were and they were slavery. I used to think it was disrespect to say that to these people, especially white people. I used to feel like that, call these people sir and ma'am. But I learned that was the terbia that our parents used to get as kofar from their parents. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Addressing the teacher in a particular way. Today, the Muslim child will say to his father, hey, Ahmed. Says to his mother, hey, Fatima. As if she's her friend or something like that. So this is an issue that every father, every mother is responsible for. We're responsible to make sure that our children not only address and speak to people with respect, but amongst themselves. Because this is what the Quran is like that. Look, man with his son, all of them are always speaking to each other with these respectful terms. Another issue, Ikhwani, concerning this is that Yusuf said, I saw 11 stars and I saw the sun and the moon making sajda to me. The Lord of Islam said, in this ayat, the shams that was mentioned first, the sun, represents his mother, and the qamar represents the father. So Allah mentioned, I saw the sun and the moon. They said this is an indication, the proof from the benefits of the ayat, that the mother has more rights over you than your father. Like that hadith, Ya Rasulullah, Man ahaqqu nas bi husni sahabati. Who has the most right for me to be good to him? Your mother, your mother, your mother. And then who? Your father. It also shows that the youngster, the youngster is in more need of his mother than he is of his father. And I hope at some point, some class is going to be given about the rules and regulations about custody of the child when there's a divorce. We have brothers in our community who don't know much about the religion and when the divorce is going to take place, he wants to insist, I get my children. You get married, I get my children. The man doesn't automatically get his child in Islam. The parent that gets the custody of the child is the one who is most fitted to take care of the child. And in most cases, that is the mother, especially when that child is young. The child... Allah described the mother as the shams, the sun. This is the sun do. Gives the people the warmth. It sends light. And gives the people the ability to see. The imam today was mentioning that in the salat of al-maghrib. Some of the benefits of the daytime. And what it was created for. So that we can go out and we can work and we can get our livelihood and so forth and so on. That mother being the shams and being similar to the shams is a clear indication. There's no one, as it relates to the mother and the father, who is more qualified to take care of that child, especially the younger child, than the mother. And that's one of the ayat of the Quran that the ulama of Islam used to show the importance of the custody that the mother should have. Yes, there are some ahadith where a woman, she got divorced and her husband wanted to take the child. So she went and she said, Ya Rasulullah, my milk, my milk, it was a fountain for my child. And my stomach, it was a protection for the child when he was in there. And my lap, my bosom, it was uh, also a covering for my child. And now his father divorced me and he wants to take my child away. The Prophet told that lady, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Enti, ahaqqu bi waladik, malam tu tazawwiji. You have more right to this child as long as you don't get married. So some people understand. If she gets married, automatically the kid goes, nah, not like that. It's not like that. She was divorced while she was pregnant. She delivered the baby. Now her idda is over. The baby is one month old. That means the father comes and takes the, the child based on the hadith. So the point here is, Ikhwani, those of us, those brothers from our community, people were hearing this. Men and women from our community. Generally speaking, your mother has more rights to your custody than anyone else. Especially for the younger child. Over the husband. 
over anyone, everyone. Because no one's going to love the child in most instances and take care of the child more and better than that mother. But ultimately, the decision goes and it decides, it lies with the individual, the mother or the father, who is the most equipped. And the Prophet even allowed, sallallahu alayhi wa other members of the family to take the child. But point is, he saw the sun and the moon. And the moon was the mother, and she was mentioned first. She was mentioned first. And I saw the moon. And in this case, the moon is his father, Yaqub, who's a prophet and a nabi. But yet, that's going to show the importance of the position of the mother. Another issue about that ayat, Ikhwani, is that the ayat, the dream of Yusuf, it shows us that in Al-Islam, dreams have a meaning. Dreams are important. We have to know the minhaj of dreams. If there were going to be a class that people were going to give that was practical, that the people need, it's one of those classes where we just do something that is about what we can really use to understand our religion and our lives, get a better grip on issues. Dreams, there's a minhaj, and El Islam dealt with that minhaj and explained it with many ayat of the Quran. Surah Al Isra. Allah Ta'ala mentioned to the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam وَمَا جَعَلْنَا الرُّؤْيَ الَّتِي أَرَيْنَاكَ إِلَّا فِتْنَةٍ لِلنَّاسِ The dream that you had, Ya Muhammad, that we showed you, we showed it to you because it was a fitna, it was a trial to the people. That ayat is talking about the dream of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now is not the time to get into the details of that. But he had a dream and Allah referred to it in the Quran. Yusuf, he had a dream. I saw 11 stars, the sun and the moon. Give me the tafsir of that. It goes to show dreams and giving interpretations of dreams. It's legislated in El Islam. But you have to have a minhaj. Allah Ta'ala mentioned another incident, and that's the incident of Ibrahim, and what we make hajj and so forth and so on. فَلَمَّا بَلَقَ مَعَهُ السَّعْيَ قَالَ يَا بُنَيِّ إِنِّي أَرَى إِنِّي أَذْبَحُكَ فَانْظُرْ مَاذَا تَرَى قَالَ يَا أَبِ تَفْعَلْ مَا تُؤْمَرْ سَتَجِدْنِي إِنْ شَاءَ اللَّهِ مِنَ الصَّابِرِينَ And when Ismail became of the age where he can walk with his father, he became older, we showed Ibrahim a dream and Ibrahim said to his son, Oh my son, I saw in a dream that I slaughtered you. So what do you think about that? I've been commanded, and the prophets and the messengers, unlike us, their dream is revelation. And based upon their dreams, there can be ahkam that come to us. We took the other day in the Shema'il of Al-Imam Al-Tirmidhi. One of the companions, his name was Abdullah ibn Zayd ibn Asim, Ridwan Allahi alayhi. He, along with Bilal ibn Rabah, two of the awliya of Allah, they had a dream, and in their dream, they saw the adhan that we have right now. They saw one man blowing a horn, the um, karm, the, um, the, what? the horn, the horn of a ram. He was blowing it to call the people to the prayer. The other man, he was hitting a bell. And then Allah showed him in the dream, showed him in a dream. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. And he came to the Prophet and told the Prophet at Fajr time, this is what I saw. The Prophet told him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, go and teach Bilal. His voice is stronger than yours. So this man had a dream that was revelation in it. It was from the Mubashirat. Ar-Ru'ya As-Saliha. And because of the presence of the Nabi, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, here in the dream, he gave the interpretation and Ahkam came. As for you and I, concerning our dreams, we make al-istitnas. Al-istitnas means you use the dream as a sign. The dream is not going to give you rules and regulations that are new. This is one of the reasons why brothers who are in Sufism, why they go astray. Because they believe when they see dreams. The sheikh sees a dream. It can make something halal haram, something haram halal, tell you to do this, tell you to do that. And they make ahkam from the beginning. The dream is something that makes istitnas. Allah Ta'ala mentioned 
another incident about the dream concerning Al Hajj and so forth and so on. لَقَدْ صَدَقَ اللَّهُ رَسُولُهُ الرُّؤْيَا بِالْحَقَّ لَتَدْخُلُنَّ الْمَسْجِدِ الْحَرَامِ إِنْشَاءَ آمِنين مُحَلِّقِينَ رَؤُوسَكُ وَمُقَصِّرِينَ You're going to Allah show the Prophet and he established a dream that he saw and it was a truthful dream. You're going to enter into the Masjid Al-Haram and you're going to be safe and secure although the non-Muslims are in control of that place and you're going to have bald heads and some of you are going to have your heads trimmed. Some totally shaven and some trimmed. Allah gave them a fatah that was qareeb after that. So the point here is, this ayat from Surah Yusuf, it's one of the many ayat of the Quran that show dreams have a place. So al Bukhari and Muslim Ikhwani, this is important. You want to know about the minhaj, what to do, what not to do concerning your dreams. He says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, al-ru'ya as-saliyahatu min Allah, wa ru'ya as-su min shaytan the good dream, that you see is from Allah, and the bad dream, the nightmare, the thing that you see that disturbs you, that's from the shaitan. So if any of you sees in his dream something that he likes, something that pleases him, then only tell someone that you love about your dream. فليلتفل عن يساره ثلاثة وليتعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم والشريها فإنها لن تضره and if any of you sees a nightmare or something that bothers you in the dream he says صلى الله عليه وسلم then turn to your left and spit three times seek refuge in Allah from a shaytan and from the evil of the dream for verily the dream cannot hurt you this companion the companion of the Nabi Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Abu Sayyid al-Khudri, he said, I used to dream and I would have these dreams and they would make me sick because I would worry. Some people from our community, they have anxiety because they overthink and they worry. They worry about their children. Is he a good father? Is she a good mother? What's going to happen to them in the future? They worry. They worry themselves sick. This companion, he was like that. If he saw a dream and it was in the dream a nightmare, something that he has no control over, something bad happens. A person sees in his dream, he's in the boat, the boat capsizes, and his children in the water drowning. So it disturbs him. This companion used to worry so much he became sick until the prophet told him. He heard the prophet tell him this, seek refuge in Allah from a shaitan, from your dream, and spit three times to your left. Another hadith said, change your position. If you're on your right side, turn on your back. If you're on your left side, turn on your right side on your back. So there's a minhaj. If you see something that is positive in your dream, don't tell anybody about it except the person who you love and you have a good relationship with that individual. The other issue, Khwani, that we want to mention concerning this is that the brothers from Yusuf's family, there's a ikhtilaf between the scholars as to whether or not they were prophets or they were not prophets. And it appears that Yusuf's brothers, they were prophets. They were prophets. Because revelation came to them. A number of ayat mentioned that. قُلُوا آمَنَّ بِاللَّهِ قُلُوا آمَنَّ بِمَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْنَا وَمَا أُنزِلَ إِلَى إِبْرَاهِيمَ وَإِسْمَعِيلَ وَإِسْحَاقَ وَيَعْقُوبَ وَالْأَصْبَاطَ Tell them, we believe in what was revealed to us. And we believe in what was revealed to Ibrahim and Ismail and Ishaq and Yaqub and the Asbat. The Asbat are all of the sons of Yaqub, the brothers of Yusuf. Another ayat of the Quran, Allah Ta'ala mentioned, إِنَّ أُوْحَيْنَا إِلَيْكَ كَمَا أُوْحَيْنَا إِلَى النُّحْ وَالنَّبِيِّينَ مِنْ بَعْدِ وَأُوْحَيْنَا إِلَى إِبْرَاهِيمُ وَإِسْمَعِيلُ وَإِسْحَاقُ وَيَعْقُوبُ وَالْأَسْبَاطِ Verily, we have revealed to you, Ya Muhammad, the same way we revealed to Noah and the prophets who came before him. And we revealed to Ibrahim and Ismail and Ishaq and Yaqub and Al-Asbat, 
the tribes, those 11 brothers of Yusuf. So they were prophets, but they were not prophets when they did all of this stuff, plotting and planning that they did against Yusuf. They were not prophets, which brings us to the other issue in the another ayat that Allah Ta'ala mentioned in the Quran when Yaqub said to Yusuf, Qala ya bunayya la taqsus ru'yaka ala ikhwatik fayakidu laka kayda. Oh my son Yusuf, don't tell this story to your brothers. Don't tell them about the dream. Don't tell them about the dream because if you do, they're going to make a plan against you. So this is where we get this thing from the sunnah. If you see something good in a dream, Yusuf saw good in a dream and what he saw is revelation. And what he saw is that those 11 stars made sajda to him, which is an indication that his brothers became good at the end. And that's one of the benefits. Al-ibra bil khawatim. The benefit is what happens at the end of your life. So they did a lot of stuff to Yusuf, but they made toba, they made sajda, acknowledging who he was. And that's when they became prophets. And that's when they became people that Allah revealed to. But prior to that, the prophet can't go and make zina if a lady invited him. Can't do that. Prophet can't conspire to kill his brother or to throw his brother away. A prophet can't say about his father that you are dalal, you are stray. No, they can't do that. But before they became prophets, they did that. Before Musa became a prophet, he killed the man. But once the person becomes a prophet, after that, he doesn't make the major sins. After that. And the mistakes and the sins that he makes, he makes toba from those sins and those mistakes right away. So concerning this particular issue, Khwani, Yosef's father, Yaqub, said, this dream of yours is special. People are going to bow down to you. You're going to have a special place. That's a ni'mah from Allah. Don't tell your brothers about it. Because when you tell people about your dreams that are good, people are going to be haters on your program. People are going to hate your program. And this is a very important lesson we got to understand right here. This story of Yusuf shows us relatives, brothers and sisters, siblings, relatives. They have more hatred and more jealousy and enmity and animosity towards one another than people who come from outside. Now, I don't know anybody here who has that particular situation, but I've come to know in this message, in this community, in other communities, our aunties and uncles, they be hating on our program. Just because this brother, his brother's child graduated from the university, the people are upset that he graduated and they hate it. Story of Yusuf proves this point. Brothers, sisters, siblings. Why is it? There's a what's up, what's up thing going out. Many women use it. They have a split picture. On the left side is a lady and she has nice clothes on and everything is clean and she's giving her children uh, whatever to eat and everything is organized. On the right side is a lady who has an alligator's head. She looks like an alligator. Over here says a mother with her children. Over here says me and my children. Why is it that our children, my children, your children... They're the ones who don't get along. Seems like everybody else's kids, they get along. But my kids, my kids, they're the ones who always, we can't get in the car without them fighting. Who's going to sit on that side? Who's going to get to sit on that side? It's always an issue. He's pulling my hair. He put gum in my hair. I hate you. I hate you too. Why is it that the people feel, why is it my kids that do that all the time? So if the mother and the father doesn't do something about this issue, then that seed that's planted, it is a natural seed. Adam's children. Read to them the story of Adam and his two sons. One of them, he slaughtered an animal. Allah accepted his sacrifice. The other one, he didn't slaughter. He gave some whacked out sacrifice. Allah accepted it from one, rejected it from other. The other one said, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill you. What's that 
ayah telling us that story telling us. Just out of the thin air, Allah is telling us this kalam. No. The very first two brothers on the face of the earth, there was drama between them. And that drama led to what? Led to one of them killing the other one because of hasad. So I look in the audience and I know some people here, we got drama with our brothers, our siblings. So what we got to do, those of you who are older especially, you have the lion's share of the responsibility to defuse this problem. Mother and your father, you cannot show the kids that one of the kids is the best one, the one you love the most. Can't go overboard with that. Because Yaqub, he didn't do it. And we're going to come to this, inshallah. How Yaqub naturally loved Yusuf. Naturally. When they came and said, let Yusuf go with us. Let him go with us. Yaqub said, nah, I'm afraid that the wolf is going to eat him. You understand from that, Yusuf used to sit with his father. He used to be in the presence of his father, learning from his father. They had to get permission. Let him go. Why wasn't he just with them? And they just go with him. You understand? No, no. This boy is being mentored by his father, sitting with his father. So here, Hwani, the point here is, point is, mother, father, got to be careful. A man who has more than one wife, or he has children from different women. What was the problem with Yusuf's brothers? Yusuf and his brother Benjamin came from one lady. And the other 11 brothers came from another lady. So there was drama. Drama. So the kids are growing up. And instead of loving their brothers and sisters from the other mother, their stepmother, they hate them. The kids hate each other. And the father has something to do with that. The way he deals with the mothers. The way he deals with them. So there's animosity. The lady in plural marriage should not teach the children. Hate your brothers. Hate your they're brothers. And usually, and usually, as I said to you guys, al-hasan al-haq ikhwani is something that happens between the people who are brothers and sisters. We're going to stop here, inshallah, as we because we're going to get ready for the adhan of Surat al-Ishat. Next Friday, we'll continue. And as we said, we're not going to go ayat, ayat to deal with all of the ayat. I'm going to take from this surah some of the benefits that the ulama mentioned. Hada wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala nabiyyina wa ala alihi wa ashabi ajma'in. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Zahid, you ready? Ayyub.